what advice do you have for entrepreneurs or people in the marketing space or people looking for a new identity or idea? You have to find something that you're willing to dedicate yourself to long term. I'm almost 10 years into this thing and you get to a point in your journey where you become so dedicated and so deep into the business process. You have to find something that is worth spending the next 10 years on building. Welcome to Pathfinders Podcast, a story about Portland's cultural creators and the past that they have forged. We are here for episode three with Bob Dalton, the founder of Sackcloth and Ashes. We've got a really awesome story to share. Um, you're doing big things. We actually both just got off of getting filmed by CNN, mm -hmm. which is cool. Um, why is CNN here? What are they uh, talking about? And how does that apply to your business, which is Sackcloth and Ashes? Yeah. Yeah, so CNN was here the last four days shooting a segment on uh, me. They selected me as their champion of change for 2024. And just doing a highlight of the work that we're doing as a business and then just kind of my overall philosophy of wanting to spread the word about localism and inspiring people to make a local impact. And your business at a high level, Sackcloth and Ashes, does some amazing work, but let's let you hit it and so people can know. Yeah. So for every blanket that we sell, we'll donate a blanket to your local homeless shelter. Mm -hmm. And our mission has evolved over the last 10 years. We're, we're just about to hit our 10 year mark. And over the last 10 years, we evolved from our core mission of wanting to donate blankets to homeless shelters around the United States mm -hmm. um, to I got the opportunity to travel around the US, get to meet grassroots leaders and learn about their work. And our mission changed from just donating blankets, which is a practical and real need, to using our platform to highlight people and organizations doing good work in their communities. Mm -hmm. And we're just now about to make our second evolution as a brand and go from using our platform to bring awareness to people and organizations doing good work to empowering people and organizations mm -hmm. to make a local impact. So that's the new kind of mission as our brand. We Our mission statement has changed to make a local impact and we want to inspire people to do something in their communities. But, which is amazing. When you sell a blanket though, whether through your website or through a local shop, we carry your stuff. That's why CNN was in to talk to us because um, you know we have your blankets proudly in our store. So when someone buys a, a, a blanket from Sackcloth and Ashes in Iowa, Southern California, Portland, Michigan, what happens then? Yeah. So we donate to the closest zip code that we, or we donate to a shelter closest to your zip code. That's cool. Um, and that's really the goal. And, and as we, uh, provide blankets to kind of the closest shelters, we kind of branch out from there and try to provide blankets to all we we're, we work with about 600 different homeless shelters in the U S but we try to donate closest to where you are actually mm -hmm. sending a blanket. So if you ship a blanket to Austin, Texas, we'll donate a blanket to a shelter in Austin, Texas. That's amazing. That's not easy to do. Yeah. Early on, you know, when I wanted to do the one for one model, mm -hmm. it had already been being done for a while by Tom's and they were shipping products overseas. Mm -hmm. And there's a little bit of problems that that created of taking some jobs away and stuff. But so the one for one, when I started it, it kind of had a bad rep around it. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, what kind of new spin can we give it? Cause I thought it was a really powerful business model. Mm -hmm. Um, and I thought with homelessness being in the United States, being right here in our own backyard, what kind of, how can we evolve the one for one model to address the problem right here? And homelessness is not a national problem. It's a local problem. And I wanted to give people an opportunity to make a difference down the street from where they live. So that's when I came up with the concept that for every blanket we sell, we'll donate a blanket to your local homeless shelter mm -hmm. and, and give people that opportunity. Where, where does the heart posture for the, our houseless population come from? Yeah. In 2013, my mom went through a series of events and ended up on the streets for a short period of time. And through her journey on the streets, it changed my paradigm of homelessness. Mm -hmm. I was the guy that would drive by people on the street and whisper under my breath, go get a job. And my mom's the hardest working woman I know. She has two college degrees, raised my sister and I primarily by herself. So for her to end up in that situation made me rethink how I view people on the streets. Mm -hmm. And so I started calling homeless shelters in my community 
and specifically I was living in the Salem area and asking what they needed. And they said they needed blankets. And so I was like, okay, that's when I came up with that whole one for one blanket concept and drove down to Joanne's fabric and <laughs> bought a <laughs> shout, out Joanne's. shout out Joanne. I think Joanne. we all have a little story at Joanne's. <laughs> yeah. Stood in line, grabbed a little ticket, you know, <laughs> <laughs> in line. Yeah. and, uh, you know, we got, a bought, got a yard of material. Or yeah, something. Yeah. yeah. We, we started the, the blankets. They were just black fleece blankets from Joanne's. Um, fabric. And then I bought a sewing machine and, uh, and then I would buy muslin, which is like the kind of looks like sackcloth, kind of rugged type of fabric. And, uh, we would screen print our logos onto the muslin hmm. and then I'd cut the logos out and they were giant. They were like, you hmm. know, six inches hmm. and we'd sew the labels on and then I'd hand fray every single label. So cool. it kind of brought, even though they were just black fleece blankets, it brought this unique feel to how were these different than all the other blankets. And we had these giant hand frayed logos and cool. obviously that was not sustainable to keep mm -hmm. up with. Do you um, still have one of those? Yeah. I have the very first one Let's go. that I made. That's basically questionable on whether or not it's an actual blanket. <laughs> There's just like <laughs> strings hanging off it yeah. still and everything. Um, I realized very quickly that I can't sew. And so I hired local seamstresses in my community to start making the blankets for me. But anybody that has a blanket with that original logo on it, there's about 200, I think out there. Um, those you are should the, buy them back. Those are the OG. I've tried to collect as many as I can and people have even gifted them back to That's me. Cool. Yeah. What does the name sackcloth and ashes mean? Yeah. Um, you know, I would, before starting sackcloth and ashes, I was the typical aspiring entrepreneur. I had like a hundred names in my phone of what I would want to name all the businesses mm -hmm. that I'd start one day. And when I came up with this concept, I thought sackcloth and ashes was the perfect name because it's a uh, Jewish symbolism. That means mourning and repentance. So the idea was every time somebody wraps themselves in a blanket, it symbolizes mourning over the homeless population mm -hmm. and repentance by contributing to a shelter in your area. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a little bit of a mix of you know, the overall state of how I felt society viewed the homeless, but it was also my, this is my own journey of repentance, the changing of my mind of how I view people on the street. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we served at night strike last night, which is a great organization here in Portland. That's been around for 20 years yeah, now, which is amazing. A long time. And every Thursday night, they don't miss it. Uh, groups of volunteers head downtown Portland. They meet at a local spot in old town and they walk to under the Burnside bridge where they provide service for our houseless brothers and sisters down there. So, um, doing free haircuts, a warm meal, um, feet washing snacks, and they get a blanket. Yeah. And how does that tie into sackcloth and what, and what you guys have been doing? Yeah. So as we donate, as we've donated blankets to shelters around the United States, one of the things I started doing was blanket drops mm -hmm. and getting an opportunity to actually go to homeless programs or shelters and donate blankets in person. And it was my way of being able to educate myself on the solutions that are being created to help the homeless problem. And at first it started with just, you know, going down to a shelter and it was just getting a tour and getting uh, familiar with the organizations, but then they, the blanket drops became an opportunity for me to invite people into these experiences. So we've had, you know, some of our business partners, uh, companies that we partner with bring their executives to these blanket drops. Mm -hmm. So um, we've had celebrities join in, but they've become a great vehicle for us to actually get people active in their communities. And that's what played into our mission now, which is to empower people to make a local impact. We want people to get involved locally and the blanket drops were an easy way for us to like, Hey, come and see the awesome work that's going on in your community and get involved. Mm -hmm. And most of the time people come down and serve and uh, get a tour and get to hear from the people running those programs. And they're always blown away. And they're like, man, I want to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. So those blankets that were given away were those the free ones of the people that have purchased a blanket in the area. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So we donated last night at night strike about 400 blankets and they went quick. You mm -hmm. saw how quick they mm -hmm. went. It, um, last time we did a blanket drop at night strike, we brought 300 blankets. They went quick. So this time we we're like, all right, we'll bring 400 and they, they went quick. Last night was freezing, mm -hmm. it was freezing cold. It was raining. So it was a good night to, to pass out some blankets and every, I mean, immediately when people got the blankets, they were wrapping yeah. themselves in it and yep. walking around with the blankets. Um, we gave a couple to most of the people just because of how cold it was. Do you, do you leave those saying you wish you had more? 
every time? Yeah. For the most part, you know, there's some events where, um, when we're doing them at like actual homeless shelters, we usually send, um, an over amount to where we don't just pass out the blankets, but then they have a good stock mm -hmm. for a while. Events like night strike, it's always amazing how many we actually just go through. Mm -hmm. Where is everything made? Where are you guys producing? Where's the material from? Yeah. So we went from Joanne's <laughs> shout out to, Joanne. uh, shout out to Joan, uh, to buying, uh, blankets from Mexico mm -hmm. and getting them shipped to Oregon. And then we'd put our labels on them. And that wasn't sustainable either as the company continued to scale. And so I was able to find a manufacturer. I was able to find a manufacturer. Do it again. I was able to find a manufacturer in Italy, hmm. um, in specifically in Florence that have been making fabric for a really long time. Like they were, this community is known for producing fabrics. And I went over there, got to meet them. And it was a really extensive process of them making fabric. They make all of their fabric out of recycled materials. Cool. So the fabric starts with like t-shirts, sweatshirts, get put into a carding process, grinds them up, and then it gets turned into yarn and then it gets put into a, a loom and then it gets, goes through a washing process. So there's like about nine businesses that mm. actually touch our fabric, um, in the making of the fabric. And then once the fabric's made in Italy, uh, it gets shipped to our production hub in Oregon mm. where we finish the product. We cut, sew, label, poly bag, and do all of our own fulfillment out of our facility in Salem. Yeah, Ben, it's great. What's your campaign for, is it blanket the world, blanket the country, blanket, blanket the United States, blanket the U S but eventually blanket the world, right? Yeah. We, we launched blanket the United States in 2018 with the goal of donating a million blankets. And you know, the idea of the campaign was to just donate as many blankets as we can. If I could go back in time, I probably would have launched the campaign under a different name. Um, cause blank of the United States really posed sackcloth as the hero in some regard. And as I got to travel around the United States and meet with these grassroots leaders, I realized very quickly, like sackcloth is not the hero of the story, nor are we trying to be the company that's championing something. Um, you got all these, people in communities that have been showing up day in and day out serving their communities. And that's when we were like, yes, we'll, we'll continue to donate blankets. It's a practical, real need that, that shelters and people need, but blankets now have become a bridge that's connecting us with people doing good work around the U S that we can now use our platform to highlight support, bring awareness to. And so even with the CNN segment, it's, it was a little bit of, um, an awkward thing for me as the champion of change because I, I know deep down the, the real heroes, the real champions are the ones that are showing up and doing good work in their communities. I'm trying to play my small role at bringing awareness to them. Um, and so it's uh, humbling to get the opportunity to work with CNN, but at the end of the day, I even you know told them, I was like, it's really important for me to highlight the work of a grassroots organization as part of this segment to really show what my work is really about. Mm -hmm. I, I really want to bring awareness to the people that are actually doing the work. Talk about the box. Yeah. The blankets come in a box that we designed in 2018 when we launched blanket, the United States that as of right now, they have, a, it has a map of the U S and shows all the different shelters that we donate to. Um, but when you pull your blanket out of the box on the bottom of the inside of the box, it says, take it a step further, place the following items in this box and donate to your local shelter. It says socks, hand sanitizer, mm. uh, and snacks. And we wanted our customers to receive the blanket and be like, Oh wow, this is, you know, a great product, a great mission, but then get an opportunity to do something. And I believe that the majority of people, they want to make a difference, but they don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the packaging was an opportunity for us. How can we redesign packaging where it doesn't just go to waste, but it ends up getting repurposed and reused to do something positive um, and to give people an opportunity to look at themselves and go, man, where am I? I know a blanket's donated on behalf of my purchase, but where am I at with this issue? Mm -hmm. what, what am I doing? And we've had a lot of people, families fill the boxes up and, and donate them. And it's been a great way to, in a small way, to give people an opportunity to make a difference. Yeah, you know, in Portland, we, um, we obviously have a houselessness issue mm. and everyone knows it, experiences it. Yeah. And I think talk, talk to us more and share more kind of the, 
difference between maybe someone who's truly houseless, someone who has mental health issues, someone who's mm-hmm. maybe addicted to drugs, and how I think society just puts all of them into one bucket and yeah. just says that type of person is causing problems or something. Yeah. But from the inside, and you've done so much work in that community now, and especially having a mother who was houseless for a while, mm-hmm. like talk to us about just the difference of people that are on the street and maybe help give some normalization to that. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, the new framework that I'm trying to work off of is that homelessness is not necessarily the problem. It's a result of a lot of different problems. Mm -hmm. Um, It's the puddle in which a lot of different streams of problems flow into. And so you have to really understand that, you know, homelessness is not just the person on the street holding a sign Um, it's in a lot of different, it takes on a lot of different forms. And one thing that I've really been asking myself, the question is what is home? (laughs) And I've been asking a lot of people that question. I've been getting all different types of answers. Um, because how we define home is it helps us really understand and reframe how we understand homelessness. And the majority of answers that I've been getting back has been home is a safe place. And if we understand home as a safe place, then you have to look at homelessness as a place where people feel unsafe and how can we provide some aspect of safety and community to them. And so, um, so that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is how we're approaching the issue of homelessness. And there's really three tiers of services. There's tier one, which is the meeting of immediate needs. Um, so providing food and, and clothing and, and, you know, basic need so that people aren't in survival mode. Tier two is providing programs for people to actually go through and transition off the streets or out of their situations and into community where they can find recovery or a safe place to be. And then the third tier is the housing, providing housing to people. And so all three of those are very important and they can't really exist without each other. And so when people are really championing, like this is the most important strategy for ending homelessness, you have to understand that we can't just move people into housing without helping meet their basic needs and helping them transition back into a normalcy or a place of health where they can actually sustain being in housing. Um, And so all three of those Um, tears are extremely important to understand in the work of helping people, no matter where they're at, whether they're going through addiction, actually living on the streets. Um, you know, there's a lot of different situations, but I think that the way we're approaching helping the problem, we have to understand it in those three tiers. What do you think is the biggest misconception around our houseless and homeless population? Yeah, I would say the biggest misconception when it comes to homelessness is that these people are extremely smart, talented, and the majority of them have had full lives. Mm -hmm. You know, we met a lot of people under the bridge last night that used to have full on careers and, you know, have families and, um, and they just find themselves in a really tough place when they lose family members or they become an addict to something. Um, but there are, normal everyday people that have found themselves in difficult circumstances and none of us are exempt from difficult Mm -hmm. circumstances. Mm -hmm. And we could all find ourselves in a place where we desperately need help and without community, without family, um, many, many people can end up in that situation. That's what we're, we're seeing and experiencing in the United States right now. What can we do better as citizens of a city? Yeah. I'll, I'll share an analogy with you. I was walking my dog recently. I have a little Husky and we were on a walk. And I, when we got back, I saw that there's a little glass in her paw and I was like, Oh man, I need to start paying more attention on my walks. And so the next day I was walking and there's some shattered glass on the right side of this little bridge that we walk over. And so we walked around it the next day, came up to the glass, walked around it. And we did that for about a week. So finally I'm like, fuck, I might as well pick up the glass, you know? And so still didn't the next day I'm walking and this guy across the bridge is yelling at me, Hey, waving his arms. I take out my headphones. I'm like, what's up? He's like, watch out for that glass. And I'm like, man, now people are yelling at me about the glass. So finally I got a broom, sweeped it up. And the whole point of the story is that 
I was telling myself subconsciously two things when I walked up to that glass. Um, one, I didn't break this glass, so it's not my responsibility to pick it up. And two, where's the street? Where's the, where's the city? This is the city streets. The city should be cleaning up this glass. And I feel like that is the mindset of a lot of people subconsciously when it comes to societal issues is I didn't cause this problem. This isn't my problem. And this is the government's problem. This is the city's problem. This is the city leaders, officials problem. But we could also play our part in picking up the glass. And so I believe we all have a small responsibility in playing our part in making a difference in our communities. Mm -hmm. And the best way to do that is to find um, organizations in your community that's already doing good work and figure out a way for you to come alongside them and support them. So during COVID, um, we saw a huge rise of people that want to make a difference, but they don't know where to start. And we saw a huge rise of organizations that desperately need awareness and support. And so I asked the question, how can we connect people to these organizations? And so we launched our foundation, love your city, mm -hmm. and people can now go to loveyourcity.org, search their city. And we show them all the grassroots organizations in their community and how they can get involved. They can donate money. They can fill out a volunteer form. And we even just launched local stories where you can read about or listen to podcasts or watch videos on good work that's happening in your community. And so the goal is get people plugged in to an organization that's already doing good work and figure out a way that we can support solutions. That's great. Those are awesome. Thank you for sharing those. Um, what about some of the awesome product that you guys have? Um, talk to us about some of the Native American collections that you guys have done, which I think are beautiful. And I think yeah. the story behind them is amazing. Yeah. I wanted to start working with Native American artists back in around 2019, 2020. And we had to go through a process as a brand, a transformation. Um, one of the Native artists that I was talking to, he said, you know, you have some designs that are not appropriate. And, um, coincidentally, they were nine out of our 10 best selling <laughs> products. And so I had to talk with my team and say, Hey, we're going to discontinue these products. And these were just designs that I saw in Italy that I, you know, I was like, Oh, these designs are cool. Mm -hmm. We weren't designing in house at that time. Mm -hmm. And so I said, yeah, we're going to get rid of them. So we got rid of all of our, basically our best selling products and started fresh with new in-house designs that weren't culturally inappropriate. And that opened up the door for us to start working with Native American artists. And so um, one of the artists that we worked with early on was Naomi Glasses. She designed a beautiful collection for us that ended up um, really doing well. And now she's the first Native American artist to design a collection for Ralph Lauren. She signed with Amazing. Ralph Lauren and she now she's just blown up. She's huge. I'm super proud of her. It's great. Um, she deserves all of it. Mm -hmm. uh, she's the sweetest person. And so to have done a collection with her and then we just released recently a collection with her and her brother, Tyler glasses, um, has been an absolute pleasure to work with her. And she's, I think she's going to go down as one of the, the most well-known and respected native American designers, um, of our generation. That's great. Yeah. That's very cool. Um, what, what kind of advice do you have for aspiring entrepreneurs, people who want to start a direct consumer business and make a cool Instagram and sell stuff that I know both of you and I have done for a decade now, and it's not anywhere near what it used to be. And, yeah. uh, and that's fine. There's uh, businesses change and marketing evolves, but what advice do you have for entrepreneurs or people in the marketing space or people looking for a new identity or idea? Yeah. Don't launch a product company. <laughs> that's typically my, <laughs> I, you create an app or something Do go digital. Um, but if you want to do just start a business, um, you have to find something that you're willing to dedicate yourself to long-term. Um, I'm almost 10 years into this thing and you get to a point in your journey where you become so dedicated and so deep into the business process that I can't just go and do something else mm -hmm. at this point. I'm fully committed to this business and this mission. And so you have to find something that is worth spending the next 10 years on building um, but on a more practical level, I, when somebody's trying to figure out whether it's a business or a nonprofit or an idea, I always say, answer two questions, find what brings you joy. That's the craft that you love to do. The thing that wakes you up in the morning. The second question is what injustice do you hate? Hmm. 
that's the thing that causes you to lose sleep at night. It might've been something that's happened to you or something that you've observed in society. But when you can do what brings you joy to bring relief to the injustice that you hate, that's when you've found your purpose. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people spend most of their careers and their lives doing what brings them joy. And they're still feeling like there's something missing. You got to find what brings you joy and bring some relief to the injustice that you hate. And that's really when you're tapped into, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. That's great. Yeah. That's super thoughtful. Thank you. Last question. I'm going to hit you with one word and you just have to give me your first response to that word. Okay. Portland. Mm. Opportunity. Opportunity. I think that Portland has gone through a really, really rough season and I look at this as an opportunity for people to rebuild and to reshape Portland how they want it to be. Um, you know, there's a lot of mixed feelings around Portland. Portland's on the map around the United States. This is a talked about city everywhere I go when it comes to homelessness, fentanyl. You know, it's on the map right now. And I see this as an opportunity for the people in Portland to really own their responsibility and, and what the future of Portland could look like. You know, you got to look at when, when a place gets hit with a hurricane, there's really three phases. There's walk through and assess the damages and accept it. It's extremely hard. Step two is to clean, clean up. There's a cleanup process in the city. And step three is build. And I think Portland's in a phase right now where, where you're walking through, assessing the damages, and now there's an opportunity to clean it up and to rebuild. And I think that uh, I'm really excited to see what the future of Portland holds because it's always been a great city. It's always been a city that I've always looked up to. I grew up on the Oregon coast and this was the city. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm really hopeful for, for Portland long-term. And I think there's a lot of opportunity around it. That's great. Couldn't agree more. How's your mom now? Yeah, my mom's doing really well. It's the number one question I get asked now. And uh, about four years into sackcloth, I was doing a blanket drop here in Portland at the shepherd's door and doing giving out blankets. And they go, hey, how's your mom now? And I go, oh, she's still going through a hard time. Um, and they said, well, we have an open spot here at the women's program. Can you get her here? I said, I'll try. You know, she was going through a really tough time. And so she, I ended up getting her there. She got into the program. 12 months later, she graduated the program 12 months sober and then stayed another 12 months. And then she got hired on staff at Shepherd's Door. And um, she now works full time at a detox facility right here in Portland area, helping people uh, in the recovery process off of off of drugs and and um, so her story is a testimony that anybody could be at absolute rock bottom and find recovery, find hope and get to a point, not where they're just getting back on their feet, but becoming a, a contributing member of the community again. Mm -hmm. And so my mom is a massive inspiration to me and she's a massive inspiration to a lot of people um, to get to the other side of, of addiction and then to get back in a place where she, you can contribute in your community again. And, and she's amazing. She must be proud. She's proud. And she was down under the bridge serving with us and that's awesome. Passing out blankets last night. And that's special. Yeah. She's a selfless servant. Hmm. Is what so I, are you. I, I'm doing my best. That's I, great. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. We appreciate you guys listening to episode three of the Pathfinders podcast. Like, subscribe, all the things. Share it with someone that needs to hear about Bob and Sackcloth and Ashes. And of course, go to sackclothandashes.com, pick up a blanket. We'll donate it at the next Night Strike. <laughs>